The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, everybody I'm guessing can probably hear me now, so I apologize for that. Um, so just to go back, go back a slide. Um, whoops. Um, so the, the announcements are available for download from the GoToWebinar handout pane. Um, I'm gonna kick things over to Robert after my short set of announcements, uh, and then we'll go into Q&A and reserve plenty of time for Q&A for everybody. Um, for the first announcement, Dr. Cog is soliciting nominations for the 2020 Dr. Cog Awards. Uh, we have a few categories. I'm going to mention two of them here. The first category is for MetroVision Awards. These awards recognize excellence, innovation, collaboration, and leadership in problem solving uh, among communities and their partners. Honorees bring business leaders, elected officials, community advocates, and residents together to accomplish more than any partner could achieve alone. The John V. Christensen Award is Dr. Cog's highest accolade and has presented, uh, been, been presented rather ever since 1973. Established in memory of John V. Christensen, a Dr. Cog founder and Arapahoe County Commissioner, it recognizes individuals who promote cooperation and collaboration for the benefit of the region. To submit a nomination, please go to drcog.org slash annual awards. Um, and as you prepare your nomination, you can find a lot of helpful information on um, on Dr. Cog's uh, updated uh, MetroVision website. So uh, the site is more than just an informational portal for Dr. Cog related plans and activities. On this website, you'll be able to find ways to get involved at the regional level or in your community. You can check in regularly to find volunteer opportunities, planning related community events like public open houses and notices of grant funding availability. The site also houses planning resources for the Denver region, including past idea exchanges, uh, resources from the region's Sustainable Communities Initiative grant, and past MetroVision plan documents. Uh, furthermore, if you have any ideas for events, announcements, or resources that you'd like us to promote, send them my way. I know sometimes sending uh, messages to a generic email account, uh, you, don't, you don't quite know where that goes, but I can uh, tell you here today, this is my face. I read that email account every single day. So send things, uh, send things my way if you've got cool uh, projects that you're working on and you want us to help promote those. Finally, uh, the American Planning Association, a partner for Dr. Cog to provide, uh, in providing um, both idea exchanges and credits for those idea exchanges, have approved one credit for people listening in person only today. Uh, you do have to go to the planning uh, APA website in order to log your credits using the number 9188735. We are obviously using GoToWebinar today. Um, please submit questions using the questions pane on your GoToWebinar control panel. It looks just like what you see on the right. Uh, we did have close to 140 people register for the event today, so everyone is muted. Um, 
except obviously the speakers in this room. Um, but we will be using the polling feature just to kick things off. And um, to get everybody used to what the polling feature looks like, I'm going to launch the first poll. Uh, and the first one is about commute, uh, commute modes. Um, so uh, when you're answering this poll, what type of, what mode of uh, transportation do you use to get to work? And if you use multiple modes, select the one that you use to travel farthest. Um, so I'll give everybody another 45 seconds or so to answer this poll, um, and we'll see how it turns out. Um, you know, this is, these idea exchanges can be, you know, somewhat of a self-selecting audience of people who are in the transportation and planning world. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see, see how that turns we'll out. <laughs> All right, so I'll give everybody another 15 seconds or so. And let's close this out and share it back with everybody. Um, so about, it uh, looks like 49% of folks uh, drove or carpooled, um, followed by 25% transit, 10% uh, bike and 10% walk. Um, which is not necessarily representative of what we see in the region as a whole. And Robert will be getting into that uh, a little bit. Um, but that is good to know where everybody's coming from, more people using transit, more biking and walking. Um, the second poll to really get us into this, um, into this same, into this mindset of thinking about congestion is how long it took everybody to get to where you're watching the webinar from today. Um, so I did include zero minutes for everybody, um, which indicates that you're off work or teleworking today, uh, and then, you know, a range of, uh, of times. Um, there has been some interesting research that's showing that commute times are getting longer for folks around the region uh, and, and nationally, so we're just kind of interested in that as well. Uh, I will give everybody another 20 seconds or so to answer. And we'll close it out. So, uh, looks like most people are in that 15 minute to 45 range, um, kind of that, that standard uh, that standard practice uh, it's held constant throughout human history of having a lesser commute than 45 minutes. Um, looks like 14% of us are lucky ducks and are, are uh, working, from, working from home or off work today. Um, so thank you for taking those polls and hopefully that gets you into the mindset of thinking about uh, transportation planning and congestion. Um, so with that, uh, I will introduce Robert Spots. Robert is the planning is a planning supervisor, the Denver Regional Council of Governments, um, and Steve, who's with us in the middle, is uh, the transportation modeling and operations manager at Dr. Cog. Um, he directs Robert's team of subject matter experts on air quality and congestion issues in the Denver region. And with that, I will turn things over to Robert. Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Robert Spots with Dr. Cog. Um, so the topics today, we're going to go through, um, you know, a brief introduction of the Denver region, mobility trends, um, how we measure congestion, and then how we mitigate that congestion. And then we're going to focus a little bit on incident management and safety, and then talk about the future and what that looks like for our region and the rest of the nation. So getting right into it, the mobility trends in the Denver region. Quick intro, uh, Dr. Cog is uh, nine and a quarter counties, a very large area, um, about 3.3 million people and 1.8 million jobs. So we are very diverse in that we have you know, dense urban areas 
as well as mountain passes and agriculture on the Eastern Plains. So as an MPO, a uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization, Dr. Cog is required to operate, to maintain a congestion management process. Um, so the kind of the main components of that are that we monitor uh, movement of people and freight and goods in the region. Um, as part of it, we've been doing annual reports every year since 2006. And those, those kind of uh, put our fingers on the pulse of what's happening on the region's roadways, um, how people are traveling. And then we typically have a special topic, a uh, focus area um, on those uh, in each report. Um, so um, the, the results are often used um, in, to kind of help evaluate how roadway transit TDM projects are working. Uh, we implement certain projects based on the results through our partners and evaluate those projects as well. Uh, it's very closely uh, oriented with our overarching shared regional um, vision for the region, which is the Metro Vision Plan. And there, there's the, the five main themes on the left there, uh, the themes that our region strives to achieve. Um, and, and there's associated Metro Vision performance measures. Um, these are the measures that our, our board felt was important for us to keep track of. Um, and we, we, are, we keep track of them on a <clears throat> roughly annual base, basis. Lots of these are interrelated to each other and um, related to congestion and how to, how to reduce congestion and improve travel for people in the region. Um, one of the main things to consider is that this, this is a document that uh, shares strategic initiatives on how we get to um, achieving these performance measures. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but this is, you know, when we consider how to reduce the effects that congestion has on people, there's kind of three main categories here, uh, avoiding it, congestion, adapting to it, and um, alleviating it. So I'll talk about those a little more, but just wanted to throw that up front. Um, so in the Denver region, we said there's 3.3 million people, 1.8 million jobs. Um, that results in about 15 million person trips every day. That is people walking to school, driving trucks, taking the bus, delivering packages, 15 million people trips. Um, so they're driving to school, healthcare, job opportunities, going to the mountains, doing recreational things. Uh, it all adds up to about people traveling about 110 million miles every day in the Denver region. That is farther than the earth is from the sun. <laughs> um, of those 15 million person trips, about 2 million of those trips are walk bike trips every day. Uh, the rest are in vehicles of some type, whether that's carpool, um, package delivery again, or taking the bus. Um, about 270,000 of those 13 million trips are trips taken in buses. Trains. And trains. Thank you. <laughs> uh, about 9 million of those the, the, those people trips that are vehicles result in about 9 million total vehicle trips. That's about 84 million vehicle miles traveled on our region's roadways every day. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, we don't have enough capacity to handle all that demand of 84 million miles of vehicle travel. At the end of the day, congestion is really just a mathematical thing. There's a, it's like a water flowing through a pipe. There's a certain amount of capacity and not much more water than that can get through it. Uh, there's all kinds of factors affecting that, the diameter of the pipe, friction factors. With travel, we also have human behavior and decisions, um, and then you know daily effects, incidents that can affect that capacity. Um, so that 84 million there, I can sh that's the same 84 million vehicle miles traveled there. This is looking at the past the past 18 years of travel. Uh, we like to monitor total vehicle miles traveled in the region because it's very important. It's kind of a proxy metric for total congestion. Another thing that's very important to us is vehicle miles traveled per capita is a growing region. It's going to be very difficult to, for us to keep total vehicle miles traveled down. Uh, we'd like to see every single person driving on average less than they do now. Um, looking through this past, there's kind of three trends that have emerged. Uh, before 2006, going pretty much all the way back to the invention of the car, um, we had a very stable uh, vehicle mile travel growth throughout the entire nation and in the Denver region. Uh, on average, in this period, it was about 2.8%. 
Uh, population is going around 1.3. So we saw VMT per capita growing at a very stable rate as well. Starting in 2006, and this is a little bit before the recession started, um, gas prices were creeping up, but this kind of anomalous period uh, happened for the first time really in the history of the automobile where we had no growth in the Denver region in the vehicle miles traveled. Population was still growing, um, but gas, pri gas prices did get really high in this period. Um, and, you know, the, the economy wasn't very good. Um, you know, this kind of indicates to us that cost is a very important factor in how much people decide to drive on the roadway. And we're kind of into, we're into this new period since where we're travel and DMT growth is a little less predictable. We've seen some slower years, some bigger years. Um, and the last couple of years, it almost looks like it's leveling off a little bit. Um, so Population has been a bit about the same growth as it was before. Uh, so this year, um, in 2018, the year of this report, um, our vehicle miles traveled per capita is about 25.7. This is the first year we've had about, you know, not an increase, so a little bit of a decrease um, since uh, 2011. Um, we do, as one of our Metro Vision uh, performance measures, the target is to reduce VMT per capita by 10% to get to it about 23 vehicle miles traveled per capita. So we're hoping to get there. Uh, the primary reason that the, the VMT is increasing in the Denver region is population growth and a healthy economy. Um, you know, in that graph, you can see the Denver region has grown at a significantly faster pace than the rest of the region. Um, our VMT has grown significantly faster as well. Um, we're going to take a, just a look back at the past five years and some trends um, that have been going on. I, just a Refresh everybody's memory, five years ago in 2013, Union Station hadn't opened. We've had major uh, rail lines opening, um, US 36, 1925. So there's been some major changes and opportunities for travel in the Denver region. Um, over that five-year trend, uh, we've had about 8% increase in population, a lot more travel, air travel happening. That's partially just the success of DIA and growing there. But um, out of all the travel trends that we watched, the one that's kind of significantly changed has been the share of people that work from home. Technology and the culture have allowed that to change, and we hope to see that continue. Um, rise hailing services have completely changed, grown significantly. We estimate about 250% increase in ride sharing since 2013. Dockless e-scooters and the share and, uh, and uh, dockless e-bikes did not even exist in Denver in 2013. Possibly as a result of these new uh, travel options that are available, we've seen transit boardings unfortunately go down by about 3% over that time period. Uh, vehicle miles traveled went up about 15%, faster than the 8% uh, population uh, growth rate, and that resulted in an increase in vehicle miles traveled per capita. Despite VMT increasing, more vehicles traveled, a uh, good federal policy, uh, including cafe standards, um, tier three fuels, uh, we've actually seen a decrease in our ozone precursor emissions. Those are the emissions we concern, we're concerned about most in the Denver region. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions still going up a little bit, but not by that 15%. Um, that, and that's, again, thanks to the CAFE standards, increased fuel economy. One trend we've seen that's very good and we hope to um, see continue is we anticipate continued large increases in electric vehicles in our region and state. Um, Dr. Kalagrak, CDOT, and other partners are working to build infrastructure to support uh, this change in um, how we fuel our vehicles. Probably the, the most concerning uh, stat is we've seen a large increase in fatalities on the roadway since 2013. Um, Dr. Cog has kicked off a regional Vision Zero plan. We hope that plan will address why this is happening and what we can do to mitigate fatalities. Um, and then as a result of all the increased VMT, a lot more congestion on the roadways than we have seen. The last, the last one of these, um, this is a, you know, this is big changes in the way people acquire goods. Um, package delivery uh, has a big impact on roadways. Um, you know, the, on one hand, you may have less shopping trips, but on the other hand, you may have a trickle of packages coming in every day and kind of just an increase in, in total travel and the effect on the roadways. Um, okay, we're doing great. All 
right, so we're going to talk briefly about how and why we um, monitor traffic congestion on our major roadways. Um, most of this is regarding the regional roadway system, which is uh, pretty pretty much um, major arterials and above is the, the thing we look at Dr. Collin we're from a 30,000 foot level. Um, you know, there are many um, national based tabulations and rankings. This, this is a graph that shows annual hours of delay per commuter um, at, by the Texas Transportation Institute. They stopped doing it in 2014, but I'm just kind of using this for illustrative purposes. You know, it, if you looked at this, you'd think that congestion had not increased since 2006 or so, uh, you know, after, after it peaked. Um, and there, there are ways you can look at congestion that may indicate that. So just looking at this period, not much change in congestion. Um, we used um, the source of INRIX data. It's, it's a you know, big data source that measures speed from cell phones and GPS units all over the region. It's a very good new source of data for us. Uh, we've got data going back to 2012. And um, I, what I did is just took a query of all the freeways in the Denver region, looked at 24 hours a day. So, you, you know, we're talking about I-70 way out east at 2 a.m. and you're kind of averaging that with I-25 downtown during 5 p.m. And when you look at all the speeds on all of our roadways, the change from 2012, which is what we're looking at here, actually looks very similar to that. Only a 1% decrease in speed on all the roadways at all times of the day. If you kind of narrow that window of time, just time, so now we're just looking to look at the p.m. peak period, four to six, you kind of start to paint a different picture. So even though it's that same selection of roadways, if you just look at peak, peak period has gotten worse on average on all of those roadways. Um, if you look, if we narrow not just by peak time, but by the most congested freeways that we analyze in, um, based on our um, CM or our congestion mitigation program, uh, those most congested freeways during the PM peak have seen an 18% dip in speed since 2012. And just to take a single uh, example, I-25, one of our most congested freeways right through the core of the city, that peak period has seen a 25% decrease in speed since 2012. So we're going to carry over that, uh, that red line, that 18% line over here. So that was the, we're looking at our most congested freeways in the Denver region. And so we wanted to look at what times of day is congestion getting worse over this period. So 18%, as we said, in the peak period, 14% uh, decrease in speed um, during the AM period. But the really interesting one, um, 2 to 4 p.m. is the sharpest decline in travel speeds since 2012. You know, we call this the shoulder period. Um, you, you know, it's indicative of a healthy economy, lots of people going out and about, doing things, whatever that is, eating, shopping. Um, it also indicates that the PM peak periods are getting so bad that that congestion is kind of spilling over into the, the, the other times, the earlier times. Maybe they're going into work early so that they can leave early and try to beat that 4 to 6 PM um, PM peak period. So, um, you know, there's a lot we want to do to address the, these, the, these um, in, these uh, decreases in speed, um, we'll get into those in just a little bit. Oh, and then there's the off-peak power. So, you know, everything's decreasing, but not as significantly as those peak and shoulder periods. So Dr. Cog, when we look at how to measure and analyze congestion, um, because I, I think, I hope I have demonstrated there's a lot of ways you can kind of evaluate congestion, how, how and when that's happening. Um, we look at congestion with a mobility score. We kind of combine four factors to determine the score. Um, the first is severity. That's how bad does congestion get on the rush, way, rush roadway during rush hour. So, uh, you know, basically you're looking at the worst hour of the day and comparing that to the best or free flow hour of the day. How severe is that congestion? Uh, duration is a very important thing for us. We, we want to minimize how long congestion happens. We're a big city. The roadways are going to be congested, but how many hours of the day does that last for? You know, we have, we have roadways in, in our region where congestion, the roadway is congested for over 12 hours a day. Um, the magnitude is also important. How many people is this affecting? So a roadway that's carrying 250,000 or more people, if that's severely congested, that's, you know, that's a significant effect on many people's lives compared to potentially a smaller roadway that's only carrying 10,000 or so people. 
And then we haven't discussed this much, we will in a moment, but reliability is the other thing. How often do crashes or incidents happen on this roadway? Uh, you know, we need to, is this a roadway we need to look at to, to improve safety um, and reduce uh, crashes and, and the effect they have on um, the carry, carrying capacity of roadways? Um, so we, we, we use these scores. Um, we give a score to every roadway segment on our 2,400 mile regional roadway system. And then we also use our travel model to estimate uh, congestion moving into 2040. That's our current horizon year, our planning year. Um, so the red lines are the corridors, the roadways we consider congested uh, today. And you know, it's a lot of roadways you're looking at. Um, we use our travel model, which you know, basically estimates an additional 1 million people moving into this region by 2040. A lot more people, a lot more vehicle miles traveled. And the orange lines are the, are the ones that pop up as being congested as we move to 2040. So it's a lot of congestion. Um, I, want, I do want to stress for a moment that this is, Dr. Collins, again, 30,000 foots, look down the entire region. This is not NEPA or quarter level studies. Um, uh, congestion, um, it's, not, it's not the same everywhere. It's, it's different throughout the areas. Um, and again, this is mostly based on um, the growth of population and people coming into this region and putting extra demand on not much additional capacity to the roadways. So congestion is increasing. Um, we're gonna talk briefly about what we can do to mitigate the impacts. Uh, we have a congestion mitigation toolkit here. Uh, this has not been updated for a while, but many of the strategies are uh, the same or similar. Um, there's kind of three main categories here. The first one is how do we optimize our existing system? How do we squeeze the most efficiency out of it as possible? The second one is how we can get people either completely out of cars or onto buses or carpools where they're, they're taking up less of that freeway space. And then finally, um, if, if it's necessary, we, we have, can add capacity. Um, this doesn't have to be about adding lanes for miles and miles. This could be uh, improving, making a roundabout or improving and redesigning an interchange. Um, so as I said earlier, um, here's our, our three main tenets of how to mitigate congestion. Um, you know, for us, success is improving reliability and safety, reducing crashes and incidents, limiting the increase of congestion. We're not gonna ever eliminate it, but we can limit the increase. And then reducing the duration, um, you know, trying to reduce the hours and hours of day, hours of the day that uh, congestion may happen on a certain roadway. So just briefly going through each one of these, um, avoiding congestion is, you know, essentially staying off the road. Um, it is the, kind of the biggest one. We've seen that trend increase in working from home, but maybe if you get a winter weather winter advisory, maybe get an alert on your phone that an incident happened, if you could just stay off the road, do you go on that trip at another time? Or, you know, possibly a carpool, you know, to, to our way to go program is a TMA service and we have a bunch of great partners throughout the region, like US 36, North Metro, South Denver, get in a van pool, get in a carpool. Adapting con to congestion long-term, uh, we're looking at land use changes. MetroVision, again, has uh, strategic initiatives that, encourage efficient and predictable development patterns that are accessible to transit and jobs, or you, you know, adapting to congestion and that you take the bus, you bike, walk, or use um, routing software to make sure you're not adding congestion where there might be an incident, something like that. And finally, alleviate congestion. I just wanted to give this example. It's a lot to look at, but uh, this is a minor improvement that CETA dot made as a bottleneck. Not much more pavement, uh, really more restriping, didn't take up anywhere right away. But the green line is, uh, or sorry, the red line is, is before the project is speed throughout the day. So you can see there was pretty big drops in speed at the, the peak hours. After this minor uh, inexpensive improvements to alleviate congestion, you can see that thick green line, the huge improvements to the speed. And the other really important thing is here, those, those lighter lines that are red are the 95th percentile. Basically, it just means that some cars are really hitting the brakes basically come, come 8, 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. And in the lighter green ones, there's a lot less um, slamming of the brakes or you know, big swings and speed reduction. Obviously that can result in crashes, which can further affect congestion. So minor improvement uh, to alleviate congestion in terms of cost, but kind of major improvements in terms of uh, 
speed and safety. So we talked about reliable congestion mostly. So congestion is very reliable. If you, you know if you travel on I-25 at 5 p.m., you're not gonna be traveling 60 miles an hour. Congestion is very reliable. Um, but there are, um, incidents are the main cause of unreliable congestion. That can be the most frustrating um, type of congestion and also have the greatest effect on people's lives if they need to get somewhere, um, but unpredictable congestion. So just an example, 18 minute trip, in the off-peak, this trip might take you 18 minutes. You know, if you're taking your kid to soccer uh, Saturday morning, it might only take 18 minutes. That same trip, if you took your kid to the same soccer game uh, and you had to do it at 5 p.m., you might just plan that's going to take me about an extra 8 to 10 minutes. You know, this is, we all know rush hour has a name because it just takes longer to get places during rush hour. That's very reliable. However, if there is a moderate incident, you know, these things can happen monthly. This could be... As, you know, as small as a car that's pulled off to the side of the road and people are rubbernecking and looking at the car, it could be more significant, like a minor crash. Um, that might add 10 minutes to your, your trip. Uh, and about, you know, on, on a roadway, potentially once a year, maybe more, maybe less, there could be a very extreme incident, um, a truck turning over or something like that, where the roadway is either closed or a major roadway is down to one lane. Extreme incident that could have you know 20 minutes or beyond to your trip. So um, what we're talking about now is this you know incidents and crashes. They they add this unreliability thing that um, you know important most important thing you can do is verify your trip before departing. To give you an example crash, you know this is a crash we looked at again using the Inrix data. Uh, there are three graphs in green there. One is the day before the crash. The middle one is the day of this major crash. And the uh, third one is the day after. And you can see the, uh, with the crash location on the left. There's an image of the results of this crash. But what this shows is it shows how, um, how far back traffic backed up thanks to this crash. And this, this was a significant crash, but there was a five mile backup queue. And not only was it five uh, miles back, but it took about four hours to clear up. So this, you know, this has major effects on the roadway system and also, um, affects the, the, the complementary roadway network that has to kind of um, have unplanned um, additional cars on it as, they, as people try to divert and get away from this, this accident. Crash. I'm calling it accident. <laughs> so far. I mean, so far, an accident. <laughs> it's not an accident. It's a crash. Okay. Uh, so incident management, there are over 200 reported crashes every day in the Denver region. Many more small ones happen that aren't reported or small breakdowns, people running out of gas, getting a flat tire. The number one concern is safety. This is something we take very seriously, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but the secondary effect is the increased travel delays for people and freight, like buses, trucks, everybody traveling on a roadway. Um, Obviously, it just affects the carrying capacity of the roadway, and it can result in heavy uh, traffic on the side. So getting information out, staying alert is kind of the main thing you can do um, after an incident happens. To support this, you know, again, supporting efforts to keep people safe at the scene, and then that's the first. We want to keep people safe at the scene, and then secondarily, we want to minimize impact to travelers. These are five programs or you know, legislation that Dr. Cox supports or is involved with um, and how, how to make people more safe and get these incidents off the road with, to, so, so we can minimize the effects of congestion on the roadway. All right, so now we'll talk about the future of mobility in the Denver region. As I've stated, um, we are anticipating major growth in the Denver region about a million more people, the associated households and jobs by 2040. Um, you know, we already have 3 million people, so how do we plan for this next 1 million people that's coming here? What can we do to mitigate the effects of congestion and make sure people can travel safely and efficiently through the region? Uh, the, you know, the forecast with those people, huge increase in VMT, huge increases in um, hours of, of congestion, basically. Um, so um, that's that's just the forecast, though. There's a lot happening that we can do to plan to mitigate this, and a lot of things that are just unpredictable or unknown to us. Um, the person, the, the way that people choose to behave, their preferences, you know, that 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 changes throughout time, and um, 
like that could change moving in the future with options that we're not even aware of, like these, uh, you know, the scooters or the dockless e-bikes or TNCs for that matter. Um, so th these new services could disrupt the, the current trends. Um, when we look at alternatively fueled vehicles, there's a lot of amazing options in terms of cleaner vehicles that don't contribute to our ozone issues or greenhouse gas issues. But there's also a chance that alternative alternatively fueled vehicles are more affordable to drive. That they are that they are actually cheaper to maintain and operate than a gas vehicle. And if if they're more affordable, will people drive more? Connected vehicles. Um, you know, one of the main things about connected vehicles is not autonomous vehicles. Connected vehicles is there's a lot of opportunities to improve safety. Um, you, know, you can get alerts if there's a slowdown ahead of you. If somebody turned on their fog lights or windshield wipers, um, just the car is more aware of its surroundings. It's a very important thing, mostly for safety. And then automated vehicles, this is just a, a huge, I mean, there's huge unknowns here. Um, this could improve safety again, could reduce or increase congestion, um, reduce uh, vehicle ownership. There's, there's so much that we don't know what, what could happen. Um, as you see in the picture there, maybe even autonomous vehicles have their own lanes in the future. Um, to address kind of this changing landscape, uh, I think we've talked about the most four, the top four, um, again, did we, sorry, this is a plan called Mobility Choice Blueprint. Dr. Colleg CDOT, RTD, and the Denver Chamber of Commerce all, all partnered basically to, to deal with the future of transportation, um, to, to keep an eye on the changes and stay ahead of these changes so we can act proactively rather than reactively as we see these changes. Um, Again, how do we prepare for driverless vehicles? Could, there could be an issue with zero occupancy vehicles driving around. Um, it could re re change lane use. Uh, there could be less demand for parking, um, or it could result again in more people driving. Um, when we're talking about transportation funding, I think most people are aware, but gas tax is not indexed for inflation and has not increased since 1991. Um, but basically, our funding mechanism for travel, for roadways and transit and bike ped is losing its effectiveness. Um, as gas tax has not increased, vehicles are getting more efficient. So what can we do to change that model, whether that's uh, you know, a VMT tax, a road user charge, increasing the gas tax, whether it's more fee-based. This is a serious issue in the transportation field right now. And then finally, data security. We're getting inundated with a lot of new data that we didn't have in the past. But how can we use that data the best while also maintaining the security of that data and um, ensuring people's privacy? So, you know, aside from mobility choice blueprints, there's a lot of work um, going on with these changes, how the, the region is reacting to this. Um, you know, each one of these studies is kind of focused in on a specific topic that we've discussed in part today. We, I've mentioned regional vision zero several times. RTD is going through a major, um, plan to reimagine RTD, there's opportunities to comment on that, how to address that reduction in ridership they've seen. CDOT has run a road usage charge pilot program, so that's how do people react when they are charged for every mile they are traveled. Um, RTD is, has a bus rapid transit feasibility study looking at corridors that may be um, good priorities to put um, bus rapid transit on throughout our region. Uh, CDOT and the, HPTE uh, have looked at express lanes throughout the region and what may make sense there, kind of like we have on US 36. And then finally, Dr. Cog runs a micro mobility work group, and that's looking at these new micro mobility options, um, such as scooters and Dr. C bikes, small car shares, things like that, that um, and how, how we can enhance those and keep them, keep the users safe. So that's most of my spiel. Uh, there's a couple examples of our annual report. You, those can be found online. You can just search Dr. Cog congestion and you will get to our congestion web page. And these are annual reports. Those mostly should be up on our website. Um, as I said, every year we do a special topic. Uh, this year's was incident management, which is why I focused on it today. But you can go back and look at our previous reports and kind of pick through the uh, special topics there. And I think I'll wrap it up there with time for questions. Great. Well, thank you very much, Robert. Um, and yeah, we will move on to the question and answer se uh, section of the event today. Um, 
So please submit your questions once again using the questions panel in your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and uh, just to get us started off, I've got a couple questions. Um, you know, we uh, we mentioned our way to go team a little bit. Um, so what are just some general strategies to get drivers to shift to other travel modes? Um, you know, so just just for background information, I'm an assistant planner. I work on MetroVision plan implementation, and I'm always struck by in our plan we would meet our MetroVision 20 forecast if we got everybody to just get out of everybody who drives to move to a different mode of transportation one day a week, and we would meet our MetroVision target. So, what are some of those strategies to to encourage mode shift? Well, if you talk, I've been talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, many different ones. You know, that comes. Uh, on different sides of things, there's the land use development side. You know, we have, we have a lot of our targets and goals and MetroVision are related to each other, that one impacts another. So things like uh, land use development uh, around transit stations, urban centers, you know, more dense, and we use the, the term dense that it's relative to where you are. You know, Douglas County increasing density means one thing, Denver increasing density means another, means another thing. There's a, the services that are provided uh, in terms of transit services, uh, way to go, uh, carpool matching services uh, is important. Uh, a lot of it is going to be just just the lifestyle cycle that different households are in. You know, a household with uh, two people and no children, you know, has a little more flexibility than a household the two people, two adults, or maybe one adult and two kids or three kids, and you're trying to shuttle uh, the children to soccer practice, to school events and things like that. So there's just a lot of activities going on. Uh, I think as Robert mentioned earlier, the cost component or the price component related to different travel uh, travel modes is, is huge. You know, we'll see big swings historically when either fuel prices go up or down, you know, a, a certain amount. And a lot of that is even more psychological. It just you, know, you see the gas prices go on a bike ride, a walk, or a drive of a few miles, and you're going to see the gas price. You know, yeah, it's like an advertisement right. in front of you uh, in many uh, instances. So hopefully we can uh, get people to drive less uh, through all these mechanisms. Then the, even on the freight side, we know there's uh, package deliveries have just gone up like crazy in the last few years. And so there's even things that we want to try to do more and through our, we have a, also have a freight plan that we're working on. And one element of that is having more consolidated freight drop off areas. You know, why, why should a vehicle, Amazon vehicle or whatever it is, have to drive to five different spots, take up space, uh, park in bike lanes, as as, I, as I've encountered, or all three of us have encountered many times, riding our bike bicycles around, uh, but where that drop-off can be done much quicker to a consolidated site within the condominium, within the apartment complex, within an office building. So that's really a very simple, you know, simple thing to do that will help uh, reduce the miles traveled. Great. Um, we have, so we have a question from the audience that's pretty, pretty similar to one of the questions that I prepared. Um, and so just um, getting into um, how Dr. Cog models transportation in, in congestion in the region, just to give folks a little bit more insight into how the transportation model and congestion modeling works. And then um, if there's examples of how uh, municipalities take that information on to develop their own, uh, either land use or transportation plans, their own. Yeah, I'll hit the model and then on sure. the CMP, maybe you can bring up Arapahoe County as an example yeah. of taking yeah. uh, the data. Well, for transportation modeling itself, um, we're going to need three more days. To <laughs> uh, no, but uh, the key to it is that it's bringing in the assumptions that are out there. It's called from a, it's federally required, and it says that we must use our planning assumptions. So it's 
the network that's out there today. So it's transit system, bicycle pedestrian system, the roadway system, all those things is part of the base of that model. So we have a transportation network and system, and then we uh, have it for the future. So we know projects that are already planned, we plug those in and I'll just say for 2040 as our future horizon. And we have the land use component, which is part of that model. And so as Robert mentioned, our population is going to be, uh, we're forecasting, it's not necessarily our forecast, it's coming from the state, from the uh, Department of Local Affairs Demographic Office. Of, we're going to have a million more people living in the area, many of which are moving here, and others is just natural growth from um, births minus deaths. So we're going to have a lot more people there. We plug that into the model based on information we get from local governments in terms of where that they anticipate the employment development to be, where they anticipate uh, population and households, and the type of development. You know, is it going to be mixed use? Is it going to be higher density? Is it going to be lower density? All of that is plugged into the model, and it churns out and, pre and then predicts future transit ridership, uh, bicycle and pedestrian trips, uh, traffic uh, volumes and associated traffic congestion. So all of that really works together and we can change some of the dials in there, which we'll actually be doing later this year. It's not much later this year, but early next year, you know, looking at scenarios, different what if scenarios, like for our next 2050 uh, regional transportation plan, which we're gonna be working on. So we can change the dials of, well, what if this happens? What if development occurs in a different way? What if prices or costs change in a different way? What if transit is free? You know, how does that affect uh, ridership? Robert, you can give a, maybe the congestion yeah, example that, of that, uh, the impacts uh, municipalities and their planning decisions. Yeah, again, you know, this again, this is a 30,000 foot level look down at the region. Yeah. Um, but you know, we, we have uh, online, we, off, we offer in our data catalog um, that map I showed you earlier with the most congested roadways in the base year for 2018 and 2040. Um, in the past, we have provided. Um, parts of our congestion database to interested municipalities. So always happy to you know, answer questions or provide data. And, um, from, and from the model also, uh, or the, the travel model, there's many different interesting types of things that can be done in, in terms of just trip making, where people are coming from, where they're going to, yeah. different times of day, how many people pass through a community to get to another community. So there's many, many things that we can do with travel model outputs and we do them often for our local governments when they have requests thanks um so um just wondering there's a, there's a few questions about um uh in you know from from the audience as well as one that i have prepared just about how roadway traffic congestion impacts air pollution and what that connection is and why um, one question is, you know, why we might not be as concerned about GHG emission growth. We, in, we're, we're concerned about yeah, we're very, yeah, we're very we are yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, One of our metro vision goals is to reduce greenhouse gases um, by 60% per person by 2040. So it's something we're very concerned about. And um, that said, um, congestion and emissions, as you saw in the slide, uh, you know, as vehicles are getting cleaner and cleaner, um, obviously still tons of work to do there. We'd like to see zero emissions from our vehicles. Um, and that's kind of an opportunity that electric vehicles provide. Um, but that said, congestion itself doesn't affect emissions as much as it used to. Um, cars are just a lot cleaner in every way um, in terms of especially uh, the, the, the ozone precursor emissions a lot cleaner, and then also in greenhouse gases. So the you know, stop and go does affect emissions. There are increases in emissions, but not as significantly as it used to be. Um, there's another question here too uh, about travel time variation, um, which was something that was kind of brought up in the difference between AM peak and off peak and, and those sorts of things. But um, uh, Travel time, just for everybody in the audience, travel time variation is one of our performance measures in the MetroVision uh, Metro Vision plan. So I was wondering if you could talk about that, both in terms of what we see now, what we might expect to see in the future. 
Um, yeah, so severity, severity was one of the, the our mobility score metrics. So it was one of the four. We just call it severity instead of TTB or travel time variation because travel time variation doesn't mean much difference. <laughs> but hard to explain. Hard to explain. <laughs> uh, but it's a ratio, you know, so it basically says uh, during the peak hour, if your TTV is 1.3, that means it takes about 30% longer, 1.3, 30% longer than it would in free flow speed. Um, so, uh, gosh, I, I don't have the regional measures in front of us, but it does. It's like 1.3, and, and if on the one MetroVision slide that you have there, you know, we think we're doing, I mean, basically the MetroVision goals related to congestion, which is the travel time variation, and also person hours of delay, both of those assume increases, you know, getting getting worse. Yeah. Um, what the goals are is to not get as worse as we think it might get. Yeah. And what we're seeing in the overall regional measures in the last few years, as, as Robert showed in, in that one graph, is it's pretty flat. So in theory, if our uh, travel time variation measure stays flat, we're meeting our goal because the MetroVision target has, I forget the amount of increase, I think it's from 1.22 to 1.3. And don't worry about those precise numbers. As Robert mentioned, these are really high level, yeah. uh, which is why when you see some of the old Texas Transportation Institute rankings of cities, that measure can change from 1.23 to 1.24 in one year, and you move five or six levels, you know, compared to other cities. And just another time to plug the MetroVision website, metrovision.drcog.org. <laughs> All of those performance measures, as well as uh, our, our progress toward those measures, uh, are included on that, on that website. And, and maybe I'll point out, too, is there are different reliability measures. That's kind of like the orange and red part of that chart that uh, Robert showed are federally required. So we have to do targets for the uh, USDOT, and we have to um, redo those every year or every two years. And those are more related to the reliability component in terms of uh, how, how well, and those are based on uh, national measures that we retrieve from national data sets. And that's where it really gets into uh, how variable is that congestion. And as Robert mentioned, very closely tied to the number of incidents. And it, as he mentioned too, can be many different types of incidents. A vehicle breakdown is, is can cause uh, congestion through rubber necking, things like that. Um, so with this question, as transportation planners, what would be your message to local to a local land use planner, community member, or dare I say, an elected official um, who could weigh in on strategies to reduce congestion? Um, but which ones seem? Which strategies seem most promising? Uh, which which seem feasible, <laughs> and uh, then the third follow up is which one should we uh, should we not touch? <laughs> not touch? Oh boy! I, I think it's uh, all right. We're not going to touch. Have people move out of Denver <laughs> back to Detroit and back to? Uh, I mean, I'll let you. Go well, okay. Your you. you're, you're pointing, but this MetroVision provides a lot of strategic initiatives. You know, mm -hmm. this is kind of like a cookbook for how local government could implement strategies that we think will reduce congestion. Um, aside from that, I think the, the one that we have directly seen that affects congestion is cost. Uh, as Steve was saying, with psychological cost, the cost of gas. If there was a VMT tax, um, you know, these are all very politically difficult things to achieve. Um, but I think, you know, people are sensitive to cost uh, whenever, whatever, whatever the decision they're making about whether they're looking at the bus versus a TNC versus walking versus biking, there's a lot of factors uh, that affect that decision. Time and money are probably the most important on those two. I think another key thing is there's things at the local level, the regional level, and the na national and world level, as we've seen in the past. So at the local level, uh, on the land use development side, Dr. Cog isn't going to tell local governments how to do their land use, but it provides many types of strategies um, that can be used uh, in various local governments around the area in promoting development type patterns that are more efficient uh, in terms of transportation. There's regional things um, that we do. Maybe, maybe someday there'll be a regional 
uh, uh, financial mechanism. I mean, RTD, that's a regional agency that uh, has its 1% tax uh, total for, for many years. That's a regional thing. National, you know, if there's a federal uh, fuel tax increase or other federal types of funding, and international, you know, with uh, things that affect fuel prices uh, and, th and things like that. So there's all these different levels uh, in terms of what can have an impact. Um, one, uh, one interesting question from the audience. Um, so have you noticed any changes with, uh, with working or partnerships with the auto industry to potentially make cars more efficient, not just in terms of the emissions that they produce, but also this, the amount of space, literal space that they take up on roadways. Um, so this question is, um, uh, what if the auto industry became a partner by creating around town vehicles that are small, just one seat, and that travel at moderate speed? So thinking in that terms, if you, is there any, any sort of progress in, in, in uh, working with the auto industry at all that you're aware of? Or? Well, we've worked with, uh, and it's primarily been the city of Denver with Panasonic uh, uh, location out at 61st and Pena. Uh, Boulevard, and they have the Easy Mile vehicle as an example there. There it's also autonomous, uh, though they say when it first operates, there will be a person in there just in case they need to grab the wheel. Um, so on the technology side is probably where we've been monitoring uh, the closest, uh, uh, and especially uh, working with uh, some of the uh, technology teams at CDOT, Colorado Department of Transportation, and also with the city of Denver that's looking at some of these. You know, I don't know that we've really worked with the companies directly in terms of these things related to size of vehicles uh, and that. And of course, with any of that, and that's where we're in such a questionable area now, even with autonomous vehicles, is a lot of the uh, methods to make these things operational are going to come from legislative actions, you know, in terms of what's permitted where, what's permitted to use, what type of roadway or facility. Will it be in a fixed guideway of its own, or will it be in mixed general traffic? So there's all those things that um, us or the auto companies can invent the greatest things. But there's going to be input from legislation, enforcement, insurance companies. There's going to be big things. All those things have to work. Oh, two more really quick things is, you know, we just saw a car to go, go out of business in Denver. That was partially yes. that. I mean, it was a, you know, a car share that could park anywhere and be parked anywhere within the boundary. So that model, I guess, didn't compete as well with the uh, ride hailing. Or, and they went from smaller network. cars to bigger cars. Yeah, they did. Yeah. And yeah. Speaking, speaking of bigger cars, we, you know, I, I attended the zero emission vehicle hearings, which was mm -hmm. you know, dealing with how to electrify and, and make force automobiles just dealers to sell a certain percentage of electric vehicles and, and one of the um, one of the main concerns that they had in that field was people in Denver and Colorado would really like SUVs and bigger. You know, part of that's the lifestyle, but part of it's just the winter driving weather. Um, there are issues with smaller two two wheel vehicle trail as we've seen this last week. Um, <laughs> you know, that we do have winter weather here and it's a concern in Colorado for attitude. And a big part of this that I always go to is uh, Madison Avenue advertising. What advertisements do you see during you know, football games? It's for bigger vehicles, for more aggressive vehicles. Uh, every single commercial you see, there's illegal driving of some type going on in it, even in safety commercials. And that we hope that some of the driver on the <laughs> Well, even in some of the safety ones where it'll show the um, person backing out of the driveway without looking, but the automobile itself breaks for them. Well, you know what? I, I hope that these connected vehicle things don't make drivers um, or any roadway user uh, less alert yeah. because they think they can depend on that. So it's, it's very tricky. Um, so uh, one, one more question from, from me. Um, there's been a lot of research, research in recent years about how commute times and distances have been growing. Um, especially in places where jobs and housing are located far from one another. Uh, and I'm wondering if we've seen similar trends in the Denver region 
um, and if you knew of how municipalities were taking on uh, that potential jobs housing imbalance. Uh, the thing to remember there is at a regional scale, regional scale really hasn't changed much at a regional level. Now, if you go to any certain, because in that, it's offset by things. Yes, there's people moving maybe to Weld County to afford a house. They're going to have longer commutes. But we also have a lot more housing units coming into the center of Denver, self-included, who now have shorter commutes. So at a regional level, it kind of is balancing out. Now, when you get to the sub-region level, that's where you see the dramatic things. And Weld County is probably the, the best example uh, of that, of the center of our region and other pockets have become very expensive. Well, everything has gone up, but in central areas, in many metropolitan areas, have gone up much higher rate. So, so a greater number of people are, are almost forced to live farther away from the main employment centers. Um, so in different communities, I can't speak for any specifically, but I know that uh, some are trying to get a better mix of, uh, if it's a bedroom, quote, a bedroom community, maybe try to get more employment. Um, if it's an area that has a lot of employment, maybe to try to get more housing there to get a little bit more uh, mixed use. And the other interesting factor in dealing with this for many years is sometimes the media or census, they'll report, you know, average commute time to work. You have to be really be careful with that one because if we had a, a lot of people all go to transit, probably on average, your commute, your average commute time of all people would go up because ge generally speaking, a transit trip door to door will be longer than a driving trip. Um, so you may see it go from 23 minutes to 26 minutes. Well, it might not be a negative thing because maybe it means more people are on transit, which tends to have a few minutes more of travel time, yeah. depending on where you, because part of that travel is, you know, the waiting and transferring. Well, that, uh, we are over 12. Uh, we've kind of gone past a couple of minutes. So uh, for those of you who are still with us, I really appreciate you um, uh, listening into the session today. And, um, uh, I really appreciate uh, you, you sharing an hour with us um, over your lunch break. So thank you once again to Robert and Steve for, for presenting and answering questions um, about the Dr. Cog congestion report. And uh, please fill out the evaluation at the end of this. Um, and we hope to see you next time. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.